All, All right, right, I'll kick it off. Can you guys uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I hear you great. Yep. Okay, great. Um, hi, Don. Um, so we are excited to present to you the um, mid-season talent acquisition strategy uh, presentation on behalf of um, the New York Mets analytics team. Um, we've been hard at work over the past 10 weeks. Uh, a few weeks ago, you, you saw our mid-season report, which had some preliminary modeling involved. Uh, now we can present to you our final recommendations. Before we get to that, uh, I'd like to set the stage with a little bit of a project overview. Um, so the New York Mets uh, aren't having the season we expected so far. We're currently in fourth place in the NL East with a record of 58 and 73. Uh, with a payroll approaching 150 million, we expected to be more competitive this year, um, which included we have a young core pitching staff that we would like to keep moving forward. However, we signed several veterans that haven't worked out as we would have liked over the course of this year. Within our division, the National League East, um, the, the Washington Nationals are a powerhouse and have been competitive every year. And the Braves and Phillies are a couple up and coming teams that already have built contenders. In addition, our minor league system actually ranks 28th out of 30 teams. So given all of this, we'd like to take a step back and refocus our, our strategy moving forward. Specifically, we think we should, and we'd recommend uh, trading several of our veteran assets that are underperforming this year and return minor league talent that we think will reach the majors quickly. Um, in a market such as New York, we can't afford a long-term rebuild. Rather, we have to return to contention as soon as possible. And given our Given our core pitching staff, we believe that we can return to be in contention for the World Series as soon as next year. Um, this will include targeting perhaps AAA players that are likely to reach the major leagues soon. Um, the Seattle Mariners are, are one team that have recently reached out to us. They're in a tight pennant race with the recently surging Oakland A's um, and the Houston Astros. And they're interested in some of our veterans, such as Jay Bruce, Jose Bautista, Jose Reyes, and Todd Frazier, and would be willing to send some of their minor league talent across. Um, what we'd like to do is have a method to determine who are the best minor league players uh, and, and who should we target um, based on will they reach the major leagues, A, and B, what will their career production be? Um, so as I mentioned, we have a core of pitchers such as Jacob DeGrom, Noah Syndergaard, Stephen Matz, and Zach Wheeler, along with a few position players such as Michael Conforto, Jonas Cespedes, and Wilmer Flores. And we'd like to build around this core with minor league talent that can supplement them and be up in the major leagues by 2019 and have a, a long career. So within this, within this deck, I'll give you a quick overview of what we plan to present. Um, we're going to go through what are our key deliverables that we're going to Are you still there? I think I've lost you. Yep, no, did can, you cut out? Can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Is he still there? I think no, I may have cut out. Yeah, I can hear everybody but Noah. Somebody might want to text him. Yeah, his computer crashed, but we can keep going. Um, so what he wanted to review uh, was just kind of what we're going to be going through in this presentation. So talking about the high-level goals and deliverables, which we just talked about, we're going to look briefly at our data sources and a data overview to give an example of the type of sources used and how we handled them as well as some of the information uh, we found by doing exploratory data analysis. Uh, there was a bit of transformation we had to do on the data, so we'll talk quickly about that. And then we'll spend some time going over the two different types of models that we developed. First off, the war model, uh, which, or the, sorry, the made it model, which predicted the likelihood of a player making it into the major leagues. And then our war model, which looked at what their estimated war value would be um, upon making the major leagues. 
We'll then finally review our recommendations and then demonstrate a dashboard and mobile app that we've created to help you, the GM, sort of slice and dice our recommendations and find other hidden uh, insights and uh, diamonds in the rough prospects that could help the Mets uh, get, to, get back to contention in 2019. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Michael, who will start going through uh, our, the summary of our data sources. Hi, everyone. So I just wanted to cover how we were developing models for our mid-season talent acquisition strategy in which we utilize the data sources that you see below in this chart. And as you can see, there's a variety of well-known baseball resources that we used. The main data set that we used came from the baseball cube. Using R, we joined the additional databases with our baseball cube data to create one single data set for modeling. So by doing this, we were able to calculate war and then build models that utilize both traditional baseball statistics and some advanced baseball statistics. We've already acknowledged that our goal to add offensive talent to organization is due to currently poor run production at the major league level. So in this case, we specifically decided to analyze batting data only. We did not choose to analyze the pitching or fielding data. It didn't align with our objective of upgrading our team. So we, we didn't look at that data and we removed the batting statistics of pitchers for the same reason. This data we then analyzed in two main groups. The first group was minor league prospect data, which was used to establish the likelihood of a prospect making the MLB or not. And then the second group is the subset of prospects that have made the MLB and then spent enough time in the MLB to then accumulate war. So this was needed to model predicted war for our potential trade targets. Um, this is Don, real quick question. Um, sure. Just for the recording, you might want to define war. So war is wins above replacement, which is um, if you're a major league player, and you are not able to play for whatever reason, and you have a, a player replacing you, um, this metric is basically to determine how much more valuable a, a starting level player is from, uh, let's say, a, a bench player that would be replacing him. Okay, thank you. So this is no, I'm back. Apologies for the audio issues. Not, not a problem. Good. My computer just crashed for the first time. I, it was terrible timing. I apologize. No problem. So um, I'll carry on to the next slide here, which is displaying our data overview. And this takes into account that we're viewing position players only. So we'll see all the way in the figure to the far left that our data includes approximately over 156,000 observations of players. And over 32,000 of these players are different minor league position players from 1977 all the way through 2017. Um, we were fortunate that we had very few missing observations in this data set. And only a small sample of them had their age and height missing, so we corrected these where possible. And then in the middle figure, we observe in the top two charts that many of the counting statistics are skewed right. This doesn't come as a surprise, though, because many of these counting statistics are heavily correlated to the number of games played by these players. Then you look um, at the, the bottom two charts, and it shows that many of the ratio style variables are normally dist distributed and these variables don't show as strong of a correlation with games played. So 
what we then did was we, we performed a, a various number of transformations on the data, and one of them included converting some of these stats to reflect on a per game basis, which you can see this in the figure all the way on the far right. And you'll see that after, after we converted these statistics, the distribution was then smoothed and the skew was removed. So this, this procedure did leave us with some outliers, but we handled that accordingly, either through removal or other procedures. Here we examined the percent distribution of minor league prospects to actually reach the majors. And over time, this is a task that's just generally proven to be very difficult. And you'll see that only 11% of minor leaguers have actually historically reached the MLB level. And I mean, it's crazy that you see some of these players don't even sign with their major league team as I guess about 34% of them do not even sign, 66% do. And there are about six different levels of minor league baseball. This includes rookie league, low A, A ball, high A, double A, and then triple A. And then there's 20 different leagues among all these levels. So it's very common for most of these minor league players to play multiple levels of minor league baseball. And then some of these players don't even advance any levels at all, let alone to the MLB level. So um, you see that a bit over 60% of players that actually sign with their teams never even get past the high A level. This is a very large number. And um, th this doesn't even account for the fact that many of these prospects don't even stay with the same organization and can be moved via trade or other team transactions. So in short, it's very difficult to find minor league talent that's actually able to reach the majors. And it's our job to find the talent. So you'll see on this slide that the figures below further display the difficulties in finding major league talent. And you'll see that over time, the number of players in the minor leagues has grown significantly. In the top figure, you can see that since 2010, the total has grown significantly higher than the growth at the major league level. So based on these trends, we expect that the average likelihood to reach the major leagues is going to de decrease over the time. So the bottom chart you see on a league by league basis, we witnessed the greatest growth of players at the rookie league level, which is due to the addition of a number of different leagues. And um, so in short, with more players to evaluate and the stats showing the small percentage to reach the majors, it has our work cut out for us. So here you see that of the 32,000 position players available in the data, almost 14,000 have played at least one game in the majors. Many of these due to injury call-ups or just short stints where the player wasn't considered to be impactful for the organization. So we had to address these type of players. And to do so, we modeled based on whether or not a player has spent more than three years in the major leagues. And these players were considered to have made it. So this tends to give, this tends to give the player enough at-bats to no longer be considered an MLB rookie. The number of position players that have made it is only 2,700, far fewer than the players who have been on an MLB roster. So in the figures here, you can see that we define the MLB players based on their war value. We group the players by their offensive war on a season by season basis. A season by season war is left skewed, which you see on the left, and it's largely between negative two and two war on the season. The data is also effectively bounded on the lower end as 
no team is likely to carry a player who's showing significant harm to the team success. So, so th this is uh, Don, quick question. So we're strictly looking at offensive players, not pitchers, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, and this is Noah, if you can hear me. Um, and the reason why, and I don't know if I got to this, and um, we have a, a very strong young core of pitchers, but we have DeGrom, Syndergaard, Mats, and Wheeler. Um, and we want to focus our efforts on specifically adding offensive talent um, there'll be much. There'll be two completely separate models you'd have to build, and given our time constraints, we felt it was most effective to focus on the offensive side. So this is Thomas, and I'd like to add one other thing: is that for the most part, we are uh, focusing on the offensive WAR. So this would not include any of the, the defensive side of the, the metric. So everything is focused strictly on increasing offensive output. Hi, this is Alex. <clears throat> I can talk about this slide. Um, so as we look at further at the actual war data, this is the average single season offensive war values per player across uh, the 1977 to 2017 data set that we were looking at. And it shows a pretty stark aging curve, which makes sense as players are developing in the major leagues and as they have more experience, they accumulate more war or more value. And it looks like in this graph that uh, peak single season war occurs when a player is age 30 or 31. Now there is survivor bias in this graph as players that play in the major leagues longer are more likely to produce higher war values in their later single seasons. But even so, we think that age will probably play a large part in determining overall war and even if they make it or not. As again, players that make the major leagues later, or as they get as they're older, as in like 25, could produce more uh, war value in that single season than earlier. So to kind of piggyback off of that, we wanted to start taking a look at this information and and see what relationships uh, each of these statistics that we look at. Uh, would have to the make it variable that we created. As we said before, a make it variable has been defined as a player who has been in the um, up in the majors for at least three seasons. Uh, to do this correlation, we did uh, we broke the population out into seven different slices. One looking at an overall career uh, metric for for the or career population uh, against the metrics and then at each different level. And the reason why we wanted to do this was partly when we were deciding how to build our models, we needed to see if there was a difference in the relationship between statistics and the, made it mo uh, the making it variable um, in each of these different levels. And as you can see here, there is. Um, overall age, as we mentioned, is the strongest predictor of a prospect being called up, but there are still a variety of on-field production st uh, statistics such as OPS, uh, OBA, and slugging that are strong uh, positive indicators of likelihood to make it. Uh, as far as negative indicators, uh, things that should make sense, striking out uh, and uh, strikeout percentage are strong negative indicators um, of this likelihood. So because of this, we had to do some transformation on our data to get it ready to model. And to do so, we used a tool called Alteryx. Um, and there's a sample workflow of what we used but basically, Alteryx is a super user-friendly, uh, GUI-based graphical user interface tool that allows you to do everything from uh, transposing uh, and changing data types, generating variables, to looking at summary statistics, generating correlations, and even <clears throat> high-level uh, logistic regression with stepwise selection. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do here. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have a license uh, at our uh, disposal to use. Um, and the, one of the benefits of using Alteryx overall for this type of project is that it is easily transferable to other users and should be very easily understood just by clicking on the icons as to what each of them do. But it was a really a, a good time saver tool and it allowed us as we were working through the data 
uh, through multiple iterations of transformations to uh, easily uh, debug and, and reproduce the same processes that we were going through. So with that, once we prepped our data, we were ready to start building our models. This is Thomas. And so uh, the first model that we, we made was the, the so-called made it model, the likelihood of a player to reach the uh, MLB and sustain at least a three year career uh, with the team. Um, we, we tried a several models. We tried the original, as you saw in the initial findings with the logistic model, which was actually a very sound and very strong model. Um, the next <clears throat> model that was tried was a support vector machine. And given, given the idiosyncrasies of the data, it did not end up being a, an effective model and could not actually create a prediction. In fact, went with a very basic prediction where up until double A, it predicted that no prospect was likely to make it to the MLB. That model was soundly rejected. Um, the other class of models used to look at it were the random forest models. Um, and that set of models actually ended up uh, being the most uh, predictive and uh, accurate of the tested models. Um, the tables on the right show the, the various thresholds that we selected based on uh, discussions with uh, internal discussions to identify to find stronger thresholds for to consider a player to have made it. Um, the second column uh, is the the factor versus the levels mean. That is what uh, the average the the average rookie player has a slightly uh, above seven percent, or rather about seven percent of the total rookies have made it to the MLB. And so, for a player to be considered made it by either the logistic or the random forest model, we multiply, they have to have at least passed a 16% threshold to even be considered by the scouting department or for further analysis. Um, and then that increases as the, uh, as the level increases. Once, you, once we reach high A or double A or triple A, we, uh, the, the players are much more refined and much closer to the MLB. And so in those contexts, we, uh, we try to we lower the the factor versus the uh, levels average of making the MLB. Uh, this uh, uh, then quick, based on can I, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. On the gra graphs on the right, is that a misprint after the A plus? Should that be double A? Uh, actually, the row below that is a misprint. Uh, after A plus, which is the high A, which should be the double right. A. Okay, so that, the that's double what I I just, is the 40%. Right. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure I wasn't misreading that. Okay, thanks. No, I, I, that, that was, uh, that was my mistake. Um, not, not a problem. And then, yeah. So at the end, uh, <clears throat> on the, the final column, we can see the sort of correct rate, the, which is the players that were correctly predicted to make it and the correct players that were correctly predicted to not make it. As the as an accurate prediction, um, as we can see, the random forest uh, slightly outperforms the uh, the logistic model for the most part. Um, the the A level model technically the logistic outperforms, but it's not substantial difference. Um, and then on the left, we can we can see the statistics to compare the uh, area under the ROC curve, which is a, a, me a measurement of uh, predictive accuracy and ideally would be one. Is In this case, we can see that similar to the correct rates, these are, the numbers are fairly close for most of the models for each level. Um, overall though, based on the, the, the uh, benefit of accuracy, the increase in accuracy from the random forest model, we, uh, we select that as our final model. And on the next slide, we can show some of the, uh, some of the impact of different variables in increasing the accuracy of the models. Um, across the top, we, we see the, 
most uh, impactful variable for each model. And in each of the cases, it's, uh, well, except for AAA, excuse me. In, uh, for, the, for the lowest models, the actual most, um, most impactful variable is, again, the player's age. Um, and then for the most part, you set down, they have the number of games played as well. Uh, AAA is actually interesting in that the, the plate appearances is, and then the hits are the two most impactful variables. And the age that the player was in AA, interestingly enough, increases the, or decrease, removing the age decreases the model accuracy more. Removing their AA age decreases the model accuracy. Um, and from these, we can see, similar to what we had expected from some of the correlation, these are of, from the correlation matrix, the meaningful variables tend to make sense for each of the models. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to uh, my colleague to uh, uh, explain the war model before we return to some final recommendations. So knowing that, or no, having a probability of a player making the major leagues for three seasons is a decent starting point, but we can expand upon that knowledge by trying to predict how productive or fruitful a player will be at the major league level. So we created us another model that would predict the total career war of current minor league prospects. This, uh, the, this model was set up similar to the made it model, as in there were six separate models, one for each individual rookie level or minor league level, which again are rookie, low A, A, high A, double A, and triple A. Um, as a as the as the as we as the models are built for each level, there were more data available. For instance, in the players in the AAA level, we could use all of their minor league stats from any level that they may have played in. However, when trying to predict a prospect in just right in high A or regular A, we could only use stats from that level and below. So with that in mind, our results are definitely more accurate for the upper level players, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so again, we looked at uh, random forests, but eventually we, we just settled on using a gradient boosting model or XG boost to predict our career war. We use an 80-20 training validation split with uh, 50 decision trees and a learning rate of 1%. And again, similar to random forests, gradient boosts use decision trees so it's similar in that aspect. Um, unfortunately, there was not a lot of players that had made the major leagues that had played in the minor leagues as discussed in the EDA section. And so we had less data to work with to train all of our models, especially at the rookie and low A levels. Um, but to begin our analysis, I first created a rudimentary baseline for the predicted war for each level. So this baseline is simply the average career war that a player that the that players had at that level. So for instance in AAA, um, I, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but um, if our predicted model cannot beat the baseline, then we would need to like rethink some of our strategies and some of our models uh, used. Um, but as you can see in the chart on the right, uh, all of our models beat the baseline except for rookie and low A, who were approximately the same. And I think uh, we decided that was mostly due to the fact that we had less data to train on for those two specific levels. And you may have noticed we used the mean absolute error. We also looked at the root mean squared error, but decided that that specific error metric penalized large differences in the error too much. So that, um, since that error metric is squared for large differences in war, that value gets um compounded as as it is squared and we did not think that because if um there as, as you, <laughs> if you look at the graphs for the predicted versus actual there are a lot of outliers and we did not want to penalize our outliers too hard because again if a, if a player has a career like uh is going to get is if we predict a player to have 20 career war and they actually have 80 
both 20 and 80 are very, very good numbers for a player to have for their career. So that large difference between them doesn't need to be penalized as much. So again, look, so now looking at the graphs, we have our predicted versus actual predictions for each level. And um, a perfect prediction would be along the X equals Y diagonal line. Um, as you can see, it looks best for the bottom couple of or for the charts on the right, which are AA and AAA, as again, I said, we had the most data for them. And uh, it kind of decreases as it goes down the further scatter. Um, some further analysis shows that we actually do a pretty decent job of predicting players with career war of less than 20. And it's just the superstars or people that are around the major leagues for a long time that our model fails to predict robustly. Um, yeah, so uh, moving on to the feature or the, the variable importances, we can see that similar to the maiden model, age is important across each level. And um, as, as well as some of the higher uh, average statistics, um, as in, in AA, for example, you can see the weighted runs above average, WRAA, as well as your uh, a player's BIP, or padding average of balls in play, as well as their on-base percentage, uh, stats made famous by Moneyball. And um, in the AAA, we have the number of games that they have played in AAA as an important feature, as well as the, num the average number of at-bats before a home run. So that kind of hints at more powerful sluggers reaching the major leagues faster or having a having more career war in the major leagues. And then for the rookie and low A, again, like I, like I said earlier, this model does not do a great job with prospects at that level. So our final recommendation for using the SWAR model to predict prospects would be to look at um, prospects at like the at A level or above. And to yeah, mitigate it further, we created an interaction um, estimate of war where we multiplied the probability of the player making it by their predicted war value. This reduces the noise in both predictions as well as creates a more, uh, a more accurate number for us to make our decisions based off of. So now that we have both the uh, <clears throat> war model and the native model, we can uh, take stock of our organization. And uh, this, this slide shows the uh, top 15 prospects within the Mets organization by the uh, expected war, which is the it's generated as a as the product of the probability of making it he made it and the the uh projected war from the, the war model the p war in the table um as we see here our top prospect by expected war is not actually a double a player but rather is peter alonzo who is very high likelihood of making it currently but is currently in double a ball and maybe not quite ready for the majors but can be a future uh future value for the organization. Um, players that we should look at right now are uh, Dominic Smith and Jeff McNeil. These are two players who have reasonable chances to uh, make the uh, uh, major leagues in addition to substantial war predictions and are in positions that could replace veterans who would be up for, uh, for trade to bring in for other prospects from the Mariners specifically. Um, and on the next slide, we can show you the, uh, we show the similar table, but for the Mariners organization. Uh, one of their top prospects is uh, a young man by the name of uh, Braden Bishop, who um, has been in some headlines recently for some uh, philanthropic work and performing uh, fairly well. Uh, Alexander uh, uh, Campos is another player that would be worth uh, considering, uh, along with uh, Gareth Morgan as three of their most valuable prospects. However, given that we are looking to try to bring the organization back into contention as soon as possible, uh, we should focus more on the AAA talent, such as uh, Eric Fila and his uh, projected 17 war and Tyler O'Neill with his projected nine war. And uh, these are some of the top prospects within their organization, but are prospects that could help solidify the, the organization for years to come. 
Yep. And putting these two putting these two together, we've seen within our organization we have talent ready to come up at first base and second base. If we uh, reconcile that against who we would like from the Mariners, we can add a couple of outfielders in Eric Felia and Tyler O'Neill. And between those four, we believe they could all be ready in 2019 and ready to form a core uh, to win right away. Is somebody speaking or? Sorry, I, no, I was on mute. That, that was okay. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, just wanted to quickly go over our dashboard, uh, kind of demonstrate how it works, how you can drill through uh, and find more prospects that could be valuable. And we'll show you both the uh, dashboard view as well as the mobile view. So using Seattle as an example, again, uh, let's we can see the the prospects that we just reviewed uh, if I wanted to see more specific data about one of these prospects say Braden Bishop I can simply click on him and I will be directed to his player detail page where I'll see the information that we showed as well as a projected role based off of the war table that we had presented earlier uh, additionally we can look at their statistics over time um, for him, he's played for about three years, so the curve's not super interesting right now, but you can see what his career stats look like across each of the teams that he's been in, as well as his basic biographical information. Additionally, based off of his make it and projected war, uh, we've generated uh, a list of similar players. So if maybe the Mariners aren't picking up on Braden Bishop, we could call, uh, we could call Cleveland and get Greg Allen or Garrett Cooper, uh, call Garrett uh, Cooper on the Angels. Uh, sorry, that's uh, Yankees, sorry, the Yankees. Yankees. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and see if they would be interested in a, a cross-town trade. By going back to the main page then, uh, we can go through and let's say if I was only interested in right-handed batters, the graphs update accordingly. And by looking at our scatter plot down here, if I wanna compare metrics over time or compare metrics between uh, for specific players I can then see uh, maybe ones that have good relationships and uh, and if I want to look at this guy in particular click on him it's Robert Perez and we can take a deeper look at him on his player page over here same functionality exists within the mobile app and has been uh, formatted specifically for this so if I want to look just at uh, a certain player level. If I want to look just at AA prospects, it will update accordingly. I can even, if I want to see just the players with the median batting average, I can focus just on them. Again, let's look at right-handers only. And then I can identify a player that I want to deep dive into. And his player detail page shows up here. Does it only do uh, Seattle and New York Mets, or could you do any team? Uh, all teams' data has been loaded in here currently. So can if you, I want to look, Dodge, can, can you do the? I, I used to love the Dodgers growing up. Show me the Dodgers. Yeah, let's look. Take a look at the Dodgers. I believe they are. L A D probably. L A N probably. It should be in here. Might be LAN. I believe it's yeah. the LAN. Yeah. It is the LAN? Okay. I'm gonna go back to the regular one. The mobile app works better on the on the on a phone rather than an emulator actually. That's okay. I'm I'm i i did not mean to play stump the chump here. I'm No, I'm no, no, no. No, you're good. Let me take a look at it real quick. Should have added a deselect all button. Can we just change the org name to LAN? Yeah, I will. Okay. All 
Okay. So if I want to look just at Dodgers prospects, I can see that if we were to trade with the Dodgers, the player with the highest uh, expected war is Cody Bellinger. We click on him, and I can see his information. It looks like he's decreasing in strikeouts and in doubles. <laughs> but that's probably due to his lower at-bats trending downward. And, and worth noting is this data is prospects as of coming into the 2017 season. So obviously Cody Bellinger had a big impact last year. Um, but for our purposes, when we were modeling, he would still be considered a prospect. Similarly, the second or one of the other top players in the AAA system, Willie Calhoun, was traded to the Rangers last year for you, Darvish, who helped them on their uh, playoff push to the World Series. So again, it just shows that our model is kind of working properly. That's got to be very exciting, is uh, knowing that it worked. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to see the names that we kind of expected to see up there. You guys should make a list of people and then sort of put it in a little time capsule five years from now and pull it out and see who makes it or who made it. I, I, I found a very interesting. Uh, I, I found an interesting uh, reality check on the model was that Tim Tebow had no likelihood of making it. Is he going to make it or not? No, none. He is he's clearly not a uh, true prospect in the expecting a MLB player from him. Unless, okay. unless you want a city bonus. He, he'll sell tickets and jerseys, which is valuable in and of itself. But from a, from a baseball perspective, he's not a useful prospect. What are, what are you showing me right now? I think you're on mute. Damn. Yep, I was trying to find Tebow. Oh. Do you have any questions on the uh, functionality of the dashboard? Oh, not at all. I'm, this is exciting. I'm, I didn't mean to derail your talk. You guys can continue. I didn't. I... Well, actually, that uh, that concludes the presentation. Uh, we're now open for questions if you have any specifically to the modeling or the dashboard or uh, any other facet of the work we've done. Oh, I, I don't. I can give you a lot of good feedback here. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the feedback after you stop recording. Don't, but keep recording right now because I want to say this. If, if you guys do decide to uh, donate your project to the, um, the Alumni Hall of Fame, uh, what I like is future students will watch this and they'll see that things didn't go perfect. For example, uh, it was Noah's, uh, I think it was Noah, your computer crashed. Yep. It was a, you know, people were talking and they were on mute, et cetera. Those are things that are going to happen when you do your presentation live. And they also happen in the real world. That stuff happens all the time. And you know what the trick is? You don't get flustered. And you guys didn't get flustered. You just, you know, oh, well, we made a mistake and let's move on. And you just went with it. And that's the only thing that I can suggest is that's the best thing you guys did is when things don't go right, um, you you just keep moving with it. And, uh, um, you know, the audience is always very understanding to these things. It's, I, I think the trick is never to panic uh, if a technical issue happens or, you know, anything like that. So um, you guys did a great job with that as well. So I just... You know, if you guys are tempted to re-record this, you know, maybe that, maybe not. Just leave it in its raw format because it can be very educational.
So Sounds good. Anyway, uh, uh, if you want to stop recording, I can give you some feedback on this. Yeah, I'll stop recording now.